I'm Jambo and welcome everybody to the Flutter Forward keynote coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya. I am Agnes Gathaya and I lead the Google East Africa team. It is our great pleasure to host you all for Flutter Forward. This is an amazing milestone. Africa is home to hundreds of thousands of developers who are part of the global community of builders. To be able to host you and the global developer community represents Google's continued commitment to Africa. This follows on the opening of a Google Artificial Intelligence Research Center in Accra, Ghana in 2019. A commitment in 2021 by Google's CEO Sunde Pichai to invest $1 billion in Africa's digital transformation. And most recently, the opening of Google's first product development center right here in Nairobi in 2020. I am thrilled to hear from our speakers about how Flutter is helping to shape the future of software development. Thank you again for joining us, or as we say in Kenya, Karibu. Habari. Welcome to Nairobi, Kenya, home to more than 4 million people. It is a bustling hub of culture and people from many places around the world. We have a rich startup ecosystem here. More than 300 companies here have made it their mission to solve some of the most pressing and challenging needs of this growing economy, leveraging technology. Behind the innovation are more than 60,000 active developers in Kenya, a number which continues to grow year over year. These developers are part of a community of more than 700,000 developers across Africa and 26 million across the world. We've seen an acceleration of demand for developers in Kenya and across Africa over the last few years. This demand is fueled by the growth of the local startup ecosystem, increased internet usage by small businesses, and the global demand for remote tech talent. At Google, we strive to support developers across the world to build solutions that meet the needs of customers around the world. We provide this support through community initiatives like Google Developer Groups and our investments to build and evolve developer platforms and tools such as Flutter into the future. We can't wait to share what we're working on. So let's get started and Flutter forward. Please welcome to the stage. Tim Sneath. <laughs> Thank you so much. Welcome, Karibu, to Flutter Forward, streaming live. <laughs> streaming live from Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> we are just so thrilled to be able to bring you a Flutter event from this beautiful location. It, it's been a dream of mine for years to bring a Flutter event to Africa. And I'm so thrilled that we're here in Afrin, Nairobi this week to share a little bit about Flutter, Flutter's progress and to point at some of the things that we're working on over the coming months. We name this event Flutter Forward because we want to show where we're going. And where better place to talk about the tech of tomorrow than the place of tomorrow. You know, Africa is one of the fastest growing parts of the world for tech entrepreneurs. More than half of Africa's developer population work at startups, and international companies are recruiting African developers at record rates. Products like Flutter are flourishing here too, and Kenya has one of the largest developer populations in sub-Saharan Africa, and there are over 1,000 members in just the Flutter Kenya community. Okay, so over the next hour, we're going to cover Flutter's vision and its momentum to date. We're going to show you some fun examples of Flutter in action. We'll show you some tools that we think will help you be productive as a Flutter developer. And we're going to show you how we're going to invest in Flutter across web, mobile, and beyond for the future. So let's start by talking about our goals for Flutter. For those of you who haven't spent much time with Flutter, we're an open source, portable UI toolkit designed to enable beautiful, fast experiences on any platform. 
Too often today, designers and developers' creativity is constrained by technology limitations. But with Flutter, we want to unleash you to build, test, and deploy beautiful mobile, web, desktop, and embedded applications from a single code base. So since our first release, we've emphasized a few different key characteristics of Flutter that we think are core needs for any developer. Beautiful, having complete control over every pixel on the screen. Fast, compiling your app to machine code rather than running code through an interpreted environment. Productive, with technologies like Stateful Hot Reload that let you see your changes as you're working. Portable running the same on every one of the six platforms, so you can develop with flexibility. And of course, open. Flutter's free, it's open source. You don't have to pay for the tools, you don't have to guess what the code is doing, you can simply go and look at it. So, just over four years ago at Flutter Live, we introduced our vision to bring Flutter beyond mobile to desktop, web, and embedded. And last year, we completed that journey with desktop. So we now have production support for six platforms, Android and iOS on mobile, and then the web, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. And then on top of that, we support others building embedders. And lots of others have done so, including Samsung for Tizen, and Sony and Toyota for different kinds of embedded Linux. And of course, Flutter has grown tremendously over those years. Right now, over 5 million Flutter developers have experienced Flutter since Flutter 1.0. And over 700,000 apps have been launched to date using Flutter, from small apps, from entrepreneurs, to those with over a billion downloads. And as GitHub noted in their recent Octavus, uh, Flutter is one of the top three open source projects by contributors. So, thank you. So let's talk about Flutter today, both the latest releases and the tools and the ecosystem that power them. Anda, why don't you come and tell us about them? Thank you, Tim. Now, are you ready to hit Flutter upgrade? Yeah. All right. So I'm pleased to announce the availability of Flutter 3.7 and Dart 2.19, our latest stable releases. I'm going to talk about a few things that are uh, examples of what's new in Flutter. So we've enhanced Material 3 support, as you've heard already. And uh, this includes migration of widgets such as radio buttons, sliders, and badges to Material 3. We have adaptive layouts, which uh, enables your app's UI to automatically scale to look great on, any, on various screen sizes. We've got menu bars and cascading context menus, uh, which are fully customizable to your app's needs. We've made Impeller, which is the uh, uh, graphics rendering engine that we've been building, uh, available now as a preview for you to use uh, in iOS versions of your app. And to help you with the iOS app release process, uh, the tool now validates some of the settings that you need uh, to be configured before you actually submit to the App Store. We've also made several updates to DevTools, the suite of uh, uh, performance and debugging tools for both Flutter and Dart. And this includes a complete redesign of the memory debugging uh, tool. And we've added uh, new features to analyze the memory usage of your app. We've only spent a short time talking about uh, Flutter 3.7 and Dart 2.19 today, because we've got a lot more to tell you about. Uh, so go to the post and read all about the details. <laughs> or you can read fast here. All right, so Flutter is not the only tool that Google uh, makes uh, or provides for you to build apps with. Firebase, is, uh, which is more than, has more than 60% of Flutter uh, built developers using it today. Uh, and Firebase provides a suite of services uh, such as hosting, analytics, crash reporting, authentication, and a lot more. Yeah. 
But you may be wondering, how hard is it to use Firebase in, in an app? So Eric, who uh, I've been partnering with on building a new app, is going to show us what it's like to add authentication to a Flutter app with Firebase. Yep, we're going to do that right now. Um, you talk through the app we're building, and I will get ready here. OK, great. So we're going to switch to Eric's screen here, so you know, uh, no pressure. Yeah. So what Eric has on his screen here uh, while he's setting up is it's, a, it's an app that allows a user to browse and play from a selection of songs. But right now, as you can see, there's this login page, right? And uh, something's happening on be behind that. And the reason is what we actually want to do here is add personalization to the app itself so that the user sees a personalized list and at some future date even want to add recommendations. So the first step uh, is we want to allow users to log into this app with their Google account. So Eric is going to, well, you know, he'd ha just have to do things like create an API endpoint on our server to validate the credentials, uh, create a token from that, um, call the API from the Flutter app, create the sign-in UI, and we haven't even gotten to the OAuth uh, flow setup. I mean, it's a lot of steps. And I'm sure you all know auth is hard, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, all of this is just the pre-work before we get to the core part of what we really want to build, which is the personalization um, uh, for the sign-in user. And that's why we're going to, in the next few minutes, use Firebase uh, to do that, so that Eric can get back to working on what we're really excited about. Yeah, so let's get started. Um, so Firebase has um, an official SDK for every product for Flutter. And you can see here that I've already added the ones that we need to the project. And we've also already gone to firebase.google.com, created a project. Um, so all that's left is to configure it, and then we can start writing code. So the first step is to just run Flutter Fire configure. Make sure I spelled that right. OK. And this will first ask us what project we want to use. We only have one, so it's an easy choice. Um, and this is going to be a mobile app, so we'll just choose Android and iOS. And we are now registered with Firebase. Um, and it's going to generate all the code we need so that whether the, we're running on iOS or Android, we know how to talk to Firebase. And that is all the configuration required. So what's all right. next? All right. So let's start writing the actual code. So in the main.dot file, which uh, Eric is going to right now, uh, we're going to import the Firebase SDK and the config files that we just generated. And then we initialize uh, Firebase. And this code reads the configuration for whichever platform the app is running on, uh, which in our case would either be iOS or Android. Yeah, so I've added that code. As you can see, it's just a couple lines. And we will now hot restart to, so that we, Flutter knows that we've loaded a Firebase app. And we'll hot restart once again for good luck. And um, we're now ready to start implementing the auth itself. Good call. So the app itself is already ready to handle the two states we're interested in here, which is either the, the user is logged in or they're logged out. And the UI has, uh, we have pages to show uh, for each of those states. Yes, so in order to know what state we're in, we're going to get the information from Firebase. And we're going to use this built-in stream here provided by Firebase that tells us when someone signs in or signs out. So that's all we need for, that's the only business logic we really need. So what's next? OK. So now we need to do the actual sign-in UI and add a button. And for this, let's just use the built-in sign-in screen widget from Firebase. All right. So I've added that here. You can see it's just one widget, the little bit of configuration. And I already hot reloaded. And you can see this nice UI is down here, provided for free from Firebase. So already made my life easier. What's next? <laughs> All right, so we've enabled the users to sign in with their Google account specifically here, but we could add uh, other providers such as Apple for iOS dev devices, social sign-in, or plain old email and password with just a few more lines of code, correct? Correct. But let's go ahead with the Google account login for now. Yeah, so we're going to sign in, and it might not look like much because we've used this app before, or Dash has, I reckon, because that's Dash's account. Um, but we will prove to you that it did, in fact, sign in in just a second. All right. So we're almost done here. 
we have a sign in user, and we could modify what we want to do is modify the home screen for a personalized playlist. But for this demo today, uh, we're going to start by the first step of personalizing the welcome message at the top there, that good morning message. Let's do that, Eric. Yeah, so as you can see, I've added this line right here uh, to get the current user. That'll be the user that's just logged in. And that is, once again, all of the business logic it takes. So now we'll update the good morning message to say good morning to the current user. Remove this because it's no longer a constant value. And finally, we will add the user avatar. This is a widget provided by Firebase that should display the profile picture of the currently logged in with user. So we'll now see if this works. And look at that. There's Dash. It says the name. <laughs> And thank, now I never have to write auth again, which makes me very happy because Firebase does it for me. <laughs> Perfect. Are we done here? All right. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. we're done here. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so using Firebase here, as you can see, saved us a ton of time uh, on the authorization part of it. And now we can go and work on the real stuff we're excited about, which is personalizing this app for our users. So developers approach building apps in different ways. Some prefer starting with the code, and some prefer a more visual approach. So I want to welcome Alex and Abel to the stage, uh, who are the founders of Flutterflow, to tell me about a tool for building visually. What up, Nairobi? How we feeling? Hi. I'm Alex. I'm Abel. And we're the co-founders of Flutterflow. We're so excited to be back at a Flutter event. And for me personally, you know, I grew up just next door in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And to be presenting here at Flutter's conference, <laughs> live in Nairobi is so special. So huge thank you to the Flutter team for having us. I hope you're ready. We have some exciting stuff to show you. So with Flutterflow, what you see is what you code. Flutterflow is an online platform that helps you build and deploy Flutter apps faster than ever before. It comes pre-integrated with Firebase, Google Maps, RESTful APIs, and more. We'll show you what we mean. We're going to build a very simple two-page application live using the NASA APIs, and Alex will explain what's going on as I build. All right. So we're going to get set up here. And as you can see, we've already built the UI for one of our pages. And you can see the layout over here on the left-hand side in the widget tree. But right now, this is just UI. And we want to connect this to some real live data. And that's going to come from the NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day API, which you can see we've already configured here, along with the NASA search, uh, Image Search API. And we've also predefined some outputs from our API responses. So going back to the UI builder, uh, the first thing we need to do is add a backend query to our page. And that's going to be an API call and specifically from the NASA Picture of the Day API. Cool. So now, all we need to do is set various widgets from our data in our response. So Abel is going to set the title, date, description, and background image on this page. And the cool thing about Flutterflow is that as we're making these changes, we're actually producing clean Flutter code, which you can always view or export. All right, so now we're just going to set the background image of this container. Right now, it's an asset, but we're going to make it a network, and we'll make it come from the URL of the response. Sweet. That's it. So now we're down to check it out. So this is the current state of our app before our changes. And we're just going to hot restart here. And yeah, what we have here is a live Flutter debug session hosted in Flutterflow. So while it's loading here, quick fun fact, there are over 200 million lines of code exported to GitHub straight from Flutterflow. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And there you have All it. All right, and there we have it. The pillars of creation. Cool. <laughs> All right, so back in our UI builder, it's time to build our second page, which is going to be a search page using the NASA Image Search API. So we'll start by copying over the content of our first page, and then just removing all the stuff that we don't really need. Next, we'll add a nifty little search bar from one of many pre-built Flutter, uh, Flutterflow templates. And let's actually add a little gradient here just for fun. 
Nice, nice. Okay. <laughs> so uh, next we'll add a stagger view, which is going to display our images from the API in a nice, cool layout. And then from there, we'll add an image, which will serve as our template image um, for our images. And we'll stylize this a little bit. And then we'll just add a quick little animation. We'll fade in just to, uh, you know, make it pop. There we go. OK. So uh, now we need to add a backend query to our staggered view. And this time it will come from the NASA uh, image search API. But this time we need to set a parameter, which is the search term. So in Flutterflow, you can set values from a variable. And in this case, we'll set the variable from the text field's value. Uh, in this case, this text field, what we've done here is actually configured it so that it updates the page on every, uh, key, uh, every time the user types, but with a one second delay so it's not on every single keystroke. Next, Abel's going to ge uh, generate the children of this staggered view dynamically from the image URL's response, which we can see here. Um, and now we just need to set the image URL of this from its respective item in the, in the results. Nice. OK, so we're ready to check out our app. So we can go back here uh, and hot restart. Cool. Uh, another fun fact while this is loading. Uh, <laughs> There, are, there have been over 5,000 apps deployed to the App Store um, and Play Store thanks to our integration with CodeMagic. So shout out to CodeMagic. Shout team. out to CodeMagic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so ready to go to our search page. And let's search for something cool and visual, like a supernova. Okay. And there you have it. So just like that, we get to witness the second most powerful force of nature in the known universe, after my grandma. <laughs> OK, so back in the UI Builder, you'll notice that our first page uh, is actually just in English, right? And, but often we want to serve an international audience. So we'll go to our Languages tab, and we'll add a few different languages. So we'll start with English, because you know, that's what it's based in. But of course, we have to add Swahili. <laughs> and Abel's going to add a few different languages yeah. as well. Okay, let's do one more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. So we'll set our base language, which was English, and then we'll hit the Google Translate button, which will use the Google Translate API to automatically translate all of the text within our application in just a few seconds. Hopefully just a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we can see our translations here. Um, and obviously modify them to our liking later on. So now back in the UI Builder, let's, let's see what it looks like in some different languages. Hey, let's try Hindi here. We got Hindi. There it is. <laughs> let's try Swahili. Swahili. And then, yeah, we can see it in Arabic as well. And you'll notice, you'll notice that we use Flutter's built-in capabilities to render this app in the appropriate way for a right-to-left language. Cool. Yeah. Now, at this point, now if you wanted to, it's very easy to go here um, in Flutterflow and just go to mobile deployment, deployment and just sh ship it to the App Store or Play Store yeah. straight from here or by Publish. So that's our demo. <laughs> Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. So everything you saw here today was built completely with Flutter. It's widgets all the way down. That made it super easy for us to launch the desktop app that you saw here, even though we started with online only at first. Uh, we want to also mention before we leave, in case you didn't know, all of our premium features in Flutterflow are free for students and educators. Yes. All you need is your email address from your educational institution, and you're good to go. Go to flutterflow.io. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So as a designer, you're probably using tools like Figma to build detailed uh, mock-ups of your app and its UI functionality. But sometimes translating that vision to code takes multiple iterations and back and forth with your development team, which is really tedious to tweak things and get it just right. 
To help solve this, there are various packages uh, that exist today on pub.dev that essentially create a library of your app's UI, piece, uh, apps UI pieces. Let's focus on one of these today, Widgetbook. So let's open up Widgetbook, and we'll take a look in this clip here. On the left-hand side, uh, we can see all the different components of the app. Clicking on one of them, you can adjust what it looks like and uh, see what it looks like in the middle view here. And on the right, uh, you have all these settings that you can, you can see how it looks. Uh, in this case, you can see, you can play with the theme right now. Uh, you can go on and change your locale and so many other things. And this is great to test things out and make sure everything is working as planned. But with Widgetbook's, uh, Widgetbook Cloud, we can go a step further. So by integrating with CI CD tools and giving uh, designers a complete platform to review changes. Now, as a developer, I'll create a commit to update the app. Uh, and with a GitHub action, uh, Widgetbook will automatically create an updated hosted library. As a developer, you can then send that link over to the, uh, to the uh, designer for review. All right, now I've got the link as a designer. And I'm going to click on it, as you can see here. And in this next view of Widgetbook, you can open up the link. Uh, and you can see even better, we've now got with, with Widgetbook's new Figma integration, you have the design on the left, and you have the new uh, implementation on the right. And as before, you can use the same set of knobs and, and features to, to look at the app uh, and, and comment, or in this case, we accept it. So that's Widgetbook. There's lots more to talk about and see about it, so you can check it out at widgetbook.io. Now, you might be wondering what apps can be built with Flutter and all the tools, some of which we talked about today. So let's hear how Flutter has helped the PUBG mobile team to build a key part of their player experience. PUBG Mobile 目前全球有十亿玩家，日活跃五千万，由光子工作室及 Craftan 联合研发。在 PUBG Mobile 中，玩家们被空投到一个荒岛上，孤身奋战或与队友合作，努力与对手周旋，幸存到最后，赢得胜利。在游戏最初的策划阶段，我们就计划为玩家打造游戏中的社区体验。我们注意到玩家希望有更多的机会在游戏中分享自己的游戏体验。特别是高人气和达人玩家们，希望能有更多的机会与更多的粉丝建立联系，让自己的精彩内容得到更广泛的传播。我们是比较小的团队，所以我们一直致力于寻找任何可以提高效率的新技术。二零二零年下半年，我们在为游戏新模块寻找解决方案时，就开始探索新的跨平台框架了，因为我们需要高效的覆盖安卓和 iOS 平台。我们测试了很多解决方案，都存在这样那样的性质，但这些性质在 Flutter 中则不存在。例如，即使我们引入复杂的业务逻辑后 ，Flutter 的性能表现一样十分优秀，达到了我们认为投产所需的水平。另外，由于我们在 Java、Kotlin、o b j e c t C 方面有着坚实的基础，让 d a t a 语言的学习成本很低，因此，在我们通过概念验证阶段之后，便决定在新模块中使用 Flutter。另一个打动我们的是 ，Flutter 可以很好的和现有的游戏进行整合，基本上照着官方文档说明操作就行，用不了多长时间。自从采用 Flutter 之后，我们发现可以将前端的工作量减少百分之八十。工作量的大幅降低，得益于使用 Flutter 之后，我们只需要写一次代码就好，这样我们就不用为两个不同的平台写两次相同的功能。单一的代码库有助于保证安卓和 iOS 平台之间逻辑的一致性。游戏中的社区模块一直很受用户欢迎。我们的统计数据表明，每月有近千万玩家使用游戏中的社区模块，分享自己的屏幕录像等内容。我们认为 Flutter 是首个真正的移动跨平台框架，它能为开发者节省大量的编程时间，同时也为公司降低成本。我们十分愿意在未来的新场景、新用力中使用 Flutter。PUBG Mobile 将继续精雕细琢，尽力地为玩家们带来更好的服务和游戏体验。
at Google, we're using Flutter too. Thousands of engineers at Google use Dart and Flutter to build apps that work across mobile, web, and desktop. Collectively, hundreds of millions of people around the world use these apps. One of these apps is Google Classroom, which is used by students across the world. So let's hear from Sophie and Kenechi from that team about how Flutter has helped their team. Google Classroom brings learning tools together in a central destination and empowers teaching and learning from anywhere. Classroom saw exponential growth in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, increasing from 40 million to more than 150 million students, teachers, and learning educators around the world, using it across Android, iOS, and the web. This led to an increasingly diverse user base, with mobile becoming an even more important platform. In the past, developing mobile features for Classroom required a lot of overhead to maintain consistency between platforms. The high volume of code also resulted in high tech debt and low code health. After learning how the GPay team was able to increase velocity with Flutter, we decided to use it for Classroom. And we're so glad we did, as moving to Flutter has fixed a lot of our issues on mobile. We're now sharing 98% of our mobile code, so we no longer have to prioritize one platform over another. We can also share complex business logic between operating systems. With Flutter, we reduced the code size by 66% for the same functionality. This means less bugs unique to each platform and less tech depth in the future. And using Hot Reload reduced incremental build time from minutes to seconds, allowing us to save an entire week of work per engineer per quarter. All of this makes our team more productive and creates a better user experience for our users. At Classroom, we create tools that are simple to use and can be adjusted to fit students' unique learning styles. A new feature we recently launched on the web, Practice Sets, enables teachers to use their existing teaching content to create interactive assignments. Practice Sets give students real-time feedback, instant validation when they get an answer correct, and in-the-moment support when they need it. Additionally, students can handwrite or draw using digital ink as they work through practice set problems. Developing deep integration with the digital stylus modality in the browser required us to leverage a WebGL-based graphics canvas to represent ink strokes and build custom infrastructure to unlock capabilities that we needed to make the feature feasible. Flutter so beautifully solved aspects we found challenging, like SCIA Canvas Kit, widgets, accessibility, and animations, to name but a few. Practice sets are now in beta, and we received tons of positive feedback from engaged and excited educators. Our tools work together to transform teaching and learning so every student and educator can pursue their personal potential. We're so excited to develop more features for Classroom that save teachers time and create enriching learning experiences for students. So cool, I'm really excited about that. Okay, so let's talk about the forward part. What's coming next? With this event, we want to give you some sneak previews of a lot of different features that aren't yet stable quality, but represent work in progress. Because we don't want just you to buy into Flutter for what we have today, but also based on where we're going. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to show you a number of different demos of things that we're working on for Flutter and Dart. And they fall into four main categories. Breakthrough graphics performance delivering seamless integration with the underlying platform, whether it's web, mobile, or desktop, bringing support early to new and emerging architectures, and continuing our focus on developer productivity. So we're going to start with the language that powers Flutter, which is, of course, Dart. So I'd like to invite Michael to tell you what we're working on there. <laughs> Knock it out. Thanks, Tim. Our vision for Dart is to enable you to create the highest quality apps with leading productivity on any platform your customers care about. And to do just that, I am happy to announce Dart 3 Alpha. <laughs> this is the first release the first preview of our next major release, and I have three things I would like to show you today. We have new language features, we have the completion of our multi-year journey towards sound all safety, oh, and we've expanded on our already comprehensive platform support. 
Would you like to hear all the details? Yes. All right. I will start with records and patterns. These are large new language features focused on making the Dart language more expressive and better suited for working with structured data. But in if talk, let's look at some code. Here is a Dart2 function that takes a place and returns a location. Currently, to return both latitude and longitude, we put both values into a list. That means over here on the caller side, we need to read out the latitude and longitude manually using positional axis. Let's hope we don't get those pesky indexes wrong. To work around that, we could you know, also define a new location class. This makes it a lot easier to get latitude and longitude out in a type-safe way. But it's really verbose to have to name and define some class just to bundle up two integers. To solve this, Dart3 adds a new type of built-in collection called records. As you can see, a record looks sort of like a list literal, but you can use it in code with parentheses instead of the square brackets. And notice, here we're using it to return a pair of two integers, giving you multiple return types, which I know many of you have asked for for a really long time. All right, over on the caller side, uh, we now get back uh, the pair of integers. Um, and to read out both the latitude and longitude, we now again use positional access. I personally really like the syntax um, for defining the record up here on our get location function. But let's see if we can get away from the positional access when we read out the elements. And to do that, we're adding patterns and pattern matching. This can be used to destructure existing structural data back into the individual elements. As you can see, the highlighted codes is matching against the pair coming back from get location. And very easily, we can read out latitude and longitude, and then just go ahead and use them. Um, if you want to, uh, you can also discard one of the fields using the underscore pattern. Sometimes you might want to just update existing variables instead of binding new ones. And in that case, you can, of course, do that too. But they can also be used on much more complex data structures. Here's an example using a class hierarchy of shapes. Let's say we now need to do something like calculate the area of the shape. Then, of course, again, we can use pattern matching in a switch statement. This time, we're switching on the type of the shape. And inside each of the branches, we can go ahead and use an extractor pattern. This allows us to read out the unique fields of each type. In this case, we're reading out the length of the square and the radius of the circle. And with that, it is trivial to complete the bodies. That's all we, thank you. That's all we have time for regarding patterns today, but I hope you're getting a feeling for how they really make the Dart language a lot more expressive. To learn more about patterns, we have a whole session on YouTube later today, and I invite you to check it out. All right. Let's talk about null safety. Sometimes, to make progress in a product, it is insufficient to simply add features. You know, sometimes you have to be willing and go back and revisit your earlier assumptions about existing features. The Dart team has been on such a journey for the past seven years to rework the Dart type system. I personally joined the Dart team nearly seven years ago, which was around the time of Dart version 1.11. And back then, Dart had a novel, but <laughs> honestly put, also quite confusing type system. Types were merely annotations, and if you ignored the optional warnings from the analyzer, you could entirely bypass the type system. Here we are assigning a string to something declared to be an integer. What would happen? You would get catastrophic exceptions when your app ran in production. In 2018, we launched Dart2, featuring a new strong type system. This turned Dart one's um, exceptions after deployment into development time errors. In Dart 2.12, 
we took another big step. We added sound null safety, which allowed you to catch null errors during development. This avoided a whole class of issues often seen in production apps. In Dart 3, the major version increment signals the completion of this multi-year journey. Your Dart code now always runs with the sound null safety, and you will no longer be able to run without it. This makes Dart easier to understand. All Dart code now runs in a single mode. And thanks to the great work by the Dart community, that's all of you, we think we're ready for this change. For packages on pop.dev, 98% of the top 1,000 packages have already migrated. Thank you. <laughs> we expect Dart3 Stable to launch later this year, but today we're making Dart3 Alpha available to enable you to test for compatibility. But notice, we expect the vast majority of code already migrated to null safety will simply work. Check out the website and today's blog post for details. But, you know, sound null safety is not just about catching null errors. There is more. Do you care about performance? <laughs> All right, I thought so. I'll hope for it. Um, sound, sound null safety uh, allows our compilers to trust the types and produce smaller and faster code. Here's an example. This is a small function um, that takes an argument and returns a result. When this code compiled to machine code with Dart 1, our compiler produced 26 machine code instructions to have all the needed runtime checking in place. With sound null safety in Dart 2, we could reduce this down to 10 instructions. And in Dart 3, with sound null safety everywhere, we're now down to three instructions. And this was just a simple function call. Imagine a large real-world program with thousands of lines of Dart code. It adds up to a huge change. All right, let's get to my third and last theme, portability. And again, this is all about enabling you to deliver apps to all the platforms your customers care about. Dart's high portability has already enabled Flutter apps to target the five major operating systems and the web. And on these platforms, our native compilers support a wide range of processor architectures, including ARM and Intel in 32-bit and 64-bit architectures. On the web, we currently compile to JavaScript, where we use our enterprise class compiler that powers some of the largest web apps at Google. New in Dart 3 is experimental support for the emerging WebAssembly standard. <laughs> And this is just a teaser. Tim will tell you everything about that in a second. But there's more. Uh, we are also adding support for the emergent instruction standard called RISC-V. This is uniquely an open source standard with no licensing fees. It enables innovation and a low price point. And Dart3 has a preview of RISC-V support so that we are prepared for this future. But let's check it out in practice. <laughs> All right, uh, this is a RISC-V um, prototyping device. Uh, I actually built this device in my hotel room last night from a box of components. It's very, uh, <laughs> it's very early, uh, so let's hope it lasts for the next uh, little bit. Um, we are running Linux. You're looking at the terminal, and I wrote a small uh, Dart terminal app, and we've compiled it to an executable, and I shall attempt to run it. And here we go. It's running smoothly. This, uh, and the point of this demo is, this really is it's a very small device. It's running a tiny one gigahertz single core processor. And as you can see, we're getting really good speed through Dart. <laughs> and while RISC-V is still very much an emerging standard, I think it has a ton of promise across a range of devices, from embedded to mobile and elsewhere. All right. So that is a glimpse of the work we're doing in Dart 3. We have new language features uh, like records and patterns. We have full sound null safety everywhere and expanded portability to new platforms like WebAssembly and RISC-V. I am personally super excited about the future of Dart, and I hope you are too. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, so that's Dart. Now let's turn to some of what we're working on for Flutter itself. And we're going to start with the web. Yeah. <laughs> Today's web is amazing. You know, it's really wild when you think about it. What started about 30 years ago as a simple format for hypertext has kind of somehow transformed into the most pervasive computing platform ever built. And we're all used to today's web apps being built with JavaScript or then the DOM or the document object model. But there are some now some new exciting standards emerging. For example, Canvas which lets you bypass the DOM and paint your pixels directly to the screen. Or WebAssembly, as Michael mentioned, which lets you target the web platform from languages other than JavaScript. So I want to be clear with you. The implementation of Flutter we're building for the web is explicitly not designed to be a general purpose web framework. We're not building another DOM-based web framework like Angular or Vue or React, because they fill that space already very well. Instead, we built Flutter to be the first web framework that's architecturally designed around these new standards. If you're targeting Canvas, we think Flutter can offer you some really useful primitives like widgets and animations and so on. And a great example of this is Rive. Rive is rapidly becoming one of the most popular ways to build interactive graphics, whether you're targeting Flutter or another platform. And for Rive, the editor itself is written in Flutter on the web. And in fact, it was one of the first things to be built with the web on Flutter. And apps like this, with their complex uh, visual needs and their complex UI needs, are really hard to do without a framework like Flutter. So Flutter's web support is still pretty new. And over the last year, we've primarily been made, focused on making Flutter on the web faster and smaller, so that it starts quickly and gets you where you need to be. We've done improvements to Canvas Kit to reduce its size. We've reduced how much work it takes to bring fonts in. We've introduced uh, deferred loading uh, to let you control which things are loaded. And we've improved the concurrency of the loading process. And I want to show you a slide that demonstrates this in action. So this is a slide that shows how we've been working, even since the 3.7 release we're shipping today, to improve the speed of loading at uh, the initial page. And what you can see here is we've done work on the current master channel and with a new custom canvas kit that, that reduces uh, the amount of time uh, a page takes to load using Flutter by 40%. And we're not done. So let's look forward. And I want to share with you three different uh, examples of how we're investing on the web. And we're going to start with WebAssembly, which uh, Michael mentioned earlier on. So I'm going to walk over. And this is my favorite bit. I get to do a demo myself. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go over to uh, the demo machine here, the Dragonfly machine. This is a, a Chromebook uh, from uh, Hewlett Packard. And uh, if we can switch over to the demo machine here, um, hopefully you'll be able to see. Yeah, there we go. This is uh, uh, Chrome. Uh, Canary, so this, I said, we're sort of really at the cutting edge here. Chrome Canary, um, and uh, we're using here uh, some experimental flags. In fact, if I go to uh, the uh, Chrome flags, you'll be able to see this uh, in action. Let's uh, quickly go here. And you can see that we've turned on a whole bunch of super experimental flags here. And what I'm running here uh, is uh, uh, the Flutter counter app, as you may recognize it from the past. But this version of the Flutter uh, uh, web uh, app is not using JavaScript. In fact, if I go into the dev tools and I make this a little bit bigger, you can see that what we've got here is instead of the usual sort of main.dart.js, which is normally the big thing that contains everything, we've got main.dart.wasm. And this is the compiled version of this code to uh, WebAssembly. Adding to the complexity of this, WebAssembly has been around for a little while, but the bit that is new is WebAssembly GC, which is a new in-development standard for garbage-collected languages. And Flutter is one of the very first garbage-collected languages to support this uh, extension to the WebAssembly standard when it comes out. So now we get all the benefits of WebAssembly from a loading perspective in terms of performance, and we also get the ability to go and interoperate with other, lang other languages that are compiled to WebAssembly. So that's coming soon, support for compiling to WebAssembly uh, from Flutter in the web. What do you think? Woo! 
I want to show a second thing, uh, which uh, is uh, called element embedding. And this is another uh, shift of, of work that we're doing, another um, piece that we're doing to improve the quality of the web experience uh, with Flutter. So again, if we go back to the demo machine here, in the past, when you have built Flutter web applications, typically you've taken over the entire screen. Occasionally, you might choose to put it in an iframe and integrate it within a, the rest of the web app. But the problem with that is you're in a sandbox. It's tough to get out of that and communicate backwards and forwards uh, with different parts of the application. The something that we've been working on here enables you to take Dart and Flutter and compile it and put it in a div as a web component, so it can be integrate deeply with the rest of the platform. So I'm going to show you this as well. I'm just going to show you in DevTools. You can see here what we've got. This is just regular HTML page that we've got here. Um, you can see all these, these buttons here. They're all actually just HTML buttons on the left-hand side here. And what I've got here is this single div here, which is the div target for the Flutter. And that's, that's where the Flutter uh, component is going to be loaded. So I'm going to go rid of, get rid of the dev tools for a moment. And this is the div here. And you can see that through a bit of JavaScript code, we filled that with the Flutter counter application. So now uh, you can see that I can do the usual things. This is the traditional Flutter counter app. But look, on the left-hand side, what you're seeing here, this is JavaScript. This is a JavaScript text box. And uh, you see that as I continue to increment the button on the Flutter side, that state can be pushed across to the JavaScript side. <laughs> Better still, I can go the other way as well. So I can hit the increment button on the JavaScript side and affect the state in Flutter. And because what you're looking at here is just a regular HTML div, you can do other things with it. You can, for example, apply CSS. So I could add a shadow effect. That's kind of nice. Or I could resize it in real time. Or I could even switch it into a device mode and skew it. Check that out. <laughs> but it doesn't just go there, because I can also flip it across. I can go into something like a text field. And these are things that you know, are often quite difficult to imp imp implement. But even in this text field mode, if I switch again back into that device mode, you can see that the text field still works. I can do selection with SKUs. That's all pretty good. Let's, let's uh, switch it up again a little bit more. Let's uh, make it uh, back into landscape mode. And let's add a spin. Oh, check that out. OK, but this is live, right? So I can still go backwards and forwards here. And I can uh, select text. And I can get, it gets quite challenging when I'm doing it in reverse. I can type into it, and it's still working. This is just like a text field in CSS with CSS effects. How about? <laughs> How about for a bit more fun, I'll just add a CSS mirror effect. So now what you're seeing here is the CSS uh, reflecting of the Dart code here. So again, I can continue to make these changes. And you can see it reflected at the, back, at the bottom. What do you think? So we think this is going to really change how people use Flutter, because now any web app can use a Flutter to add interactive graphics, to do the kinds of things with Canvas that you might want to be doing. And you're just looking for a good web framework to do rich Canvas work. So that's element embedding. I want to show you one third demo of the web, and I think you're going to like this one too. You know, pixel shaders are a low-level uh, uh, function that you can run locally on the GPU that live, give you a lot of power for doing uh, hardware-accelerated graphic effects. You can do things like blurs and glows. You can invert pixels. And a pixel shader runs on every pixel that's about to be rendered on the screen and lets you make changes to it. We've had this for a little while on Flutter for mobile. But now, with the work that we're doing here, Again, very experimental, very unstable. We're bringing it to the web. So if I can go back to my demo machine, this is a pixel shader demo that uh, Eric Gomez uh, wrote. And uh, what you see here is just a very simple example of pixel shaders at work. There's our famous dash. And uh, with this uh, slider, I can uh, change how pixelated she is. 
And this is exactly the same code that Eric wrote and demonstrated for mobile, but we've just taken it and transformed it, uh, or just taken it and compiled it for the web. And now I can do all these kind of really crazy cool effects, like adding this kind of point to pointillism sort of uh, view. And you can see that this is just what goes on as it's loading different images and applying these pixel shaders. So again, the power available with Flutter to do these high-end graphics effects is now available on the web. So again, I want to make very clear, all these things that I'm showing you here, they're super early. We're not committing when we'll ship them. This is just a proof of concept, but they give you an idea of where we're going and where we're taking uh, the web. So hopefully, uh, that gives you some uh, exciting things to look forward to on the web. But let's now talk about mobile. So I'm going to hand over to Leah to talk about that. Good job. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone. So let's turn back to Flutter's foundation, mobile. So mobile is Flutter's most mature product offering, right? But over the past year, we've continued to add lots of exciting new features. We've been improving text input. We've been adding support for foldable devices and variable refresh rate. We've been simplifying release processes, enhancing our developer tooling, and improving performance, just to name a few. But now looking forward, mobile continues to be a huge priority for our team. So first, let's talk about how we can help mobile developers start building high-quality production apps faster. All right, let's consider a news app. I think we can all agree that more and more people are reading news on their phone. But for developers, that means building navigation and search, authentication, ad integrations, profiles and subscriptions, notifications. It's a lot of work. So to help with this, we're excited to announce that the first version of Flutter's news toolkit is now available for everyone. <laughs> Maybe you've already heard a little bit about it, but it includes sample code for all the things that I just mentioned, while also incorporating best practices from Google's news initiative. And better yet, some of our early adopters have said that it reduced their time by up to 80%. All right, so let's hear from some of the publishers that are already using it. Has Press Brand is the largest digital media publisher in Morocco and the most popular trilingual news website in the country. With 20 million monthly visitors to our properties on the web and over 30 million followers on social media. Since 2007, our goal has been to be the central source of Moroccan news, both for people living in Morocco and for Moroccans living abroad. We launched both spots in October 2021 so we are very much an early stage startup. We are a Lagos-based Nigeria-centric sport media company dedicated to providing the best content about homegrown Nigerian athletes and athletes of Nigerian origin in all sports. The Standard is a multimedia company that is uh, based in Kenya. We've invested heavily in print, broadcast, and digital. On digital, we have a number of websites and mobile apps. Mobile apps are very um, important for us. As you know, we are looking at how best can we serve our customers, and almost 80% of our users are on mobile. Our French and Arabic mobile apps drive double the engagement that their respective websites do, and drive 50% of our revenues. We knew we needed to create an engaging and captivating mobile app experience for our English website as well. We learned about the Flutter News Toolkit through our partnership with Google. We worked closely with the Flutter and Google News initiative teams to design and develop a beautiful app that deeply incorporates the best of Google's consumer product and design insights to ensure that we were delivering an incredible experience to our end users. Typically, apps like the Bosport mobile app would take several weeks to prototype, but things were different with the Flutter News Toolkit. It was able to get an early version of the app up and running in just a few days, largely due to the pre-built models for account creation, content feed, data analytics, social login, and even notifications via Firebase cloud messaging. The team were really psyched up to work with the template given that there are so many things that had already been pre-loaded. They only need to work on the UI and then work with the APIs now to pull content. It actually saved us 
almost 80% of uh, the development time when it comes to uh, deploying the application. We were able to launch a full-featured app including a scrollable news feed, social media sharing, login and subscription services with only six weeks of development work. This drove 93% higher user acquisition organically, 55% higher user activity over time and finally 50% growth in ad revenue. It also helped bring in a new revenue stream from subscriptions. We are excited as a team because this mobile app is going to help us not only reach more users but also drive up engagement which helps us achieve our goal of bringing attention and engagement to Nigerian athletes all over the world, regardless of location and sports. For any news publisher who wants to optimize their mobile strategies and accelerate app development, we highly recommend the Flutter News Toolkit. Ah, it's always so great hearing from real Flutter customers benefiting from all this framework goodness. So if you want to create a news app or really just any app with lots of text and images, check out flutter.dev news. So we just covered our vertical toolkits, but beyond building an app for specific industries, it's just really helpful to have some sample code to get started. To have best practices for things like performance, accessibility, design, and that's one of the reasons why we partnered with the team at G Skinner to create Wondrous. Wondrous is a Flutter reference app that brings the wonders of the world to life on your device. And back in August, we launched Wondrous. Since then, we've had over 25,000 installs. So I hope everyone here has it installed. Now, Wondrous is a really great example of creating your own custom designs with lots of beautiful graphics and really unique animations. But handheld devices can come in all different shapes and sizes. Apple is making these really huge iPads. Samsung has these wild phones that fall into all different postures. So <laughs> it's pretty crazy, right? Uh, so today we're launching the next version of Wondrous, which features adaptive design to make sure that the app looks great on all different screen sizes. Uh, but let's take a look, right? So I have a couple of devices with me. First up, I have my Samsung Tab 8, which is a pretty big tablet. And I can swipe through the app and see these beautiful graphics, all this great imagery. And it looks really nice on this larger screen, right? But now with these tablets, we have lots of different multi-display modes. So I can drop a new app into view and see it resize. And it still looks really natural on this new format. Now let me add another one, and we'll see it resize again, looking great. So let me get rid of this one down here and make it even narrower. And still, we see that it looks beautiful, even on this really narrow screen that it's left with. So just how did G Skinner get these graphics to look so great? Well, you may have noticed that each one of those illustrations has a bunch of different pieces that are sized differently or animated differently, depending on the size that's available. So the developer actually created this nifty little widget that consolidated a bunch of the settings that a designer would then use to make sure it looks just right. So the designers actually jumped into Flutter and tweaked these numbers on the fly using Hot Reload, of course. So this way they could get it just right. All right, so that was a great example of Wondrous on a tablet, but I actually have one of those crazy little foldable devices with me. And it, it's a little bit hard to see with the code. There we go. Okay, so like I said, this looks great, but let's head over to a different screen. I'm gonna go over to this view where I can see a timeline of different events for that wonder. Here they're vertically stacked and I can scroll through. But now when I open it, I'll scroll down to that same page, and we can see that we have a whole new format. Right, so this is really just two screens side by side, and we're taking advantage of that by having the imagery on the left-hand side and the scrollable events on the right-hand side. So, looks great. <laughs> All right, so that's wondrous. And if we could pop back to the slides, thanks. So that's Wondrous. You can install it and see all the source code at wondrous.app. All right, so, <laughs> woo! 
Okay, so switching gears a little, let's move on from developer experience and focus on interoperability. So when I think of what makes a mobile app different from something on the web, I think of things like notifications, payments, accessing a user's location, or looking at their photos. There are literally thousands of APIs, but the tricky part is you have to worry about two different platforms, and each is written in a different language. So say I want to start tracking my daily steps in a new pedometer app. On Android, I might use the new Health Connect client. And on iOS, maybe I want to use the CM pedometer class that's part of the core motion framework. So in the past, we'd probably use method channels to call these APIs. But that can sometimes require a lot of code. So now looking forward, our vision is that you can call all these APIs directly from Dart. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! All right. So I'm going to show you just some of the tooling that we're working on. Uh, but just a quick note that these are experimental. So I had to write a little bit of platform code to get everything working. All right. Anyways, let's go on to the code. We can head over to my MacBook. Great. So I have VS Code open. And like I said, we're working on two new tools. And what these will do is generate something called bindings that allows us to communicate with iOS or Android APIs directly from our Dart code. So to automatically generate bindings for iOS, we're going to use this tool called FFIGen. And here I have a YAML file that handles my configuration for FFI. So I have, oops, sorry, I have a lot of devices back here. Just bear with me. <laughs> All right. So here I have things like my compiler options, my Objective-C interfaces that I want to wrap around, um, the header files that I need to use as an entry point. And now that I have all the configuration set, I can just automatically generate these bindings by copying this command into the terminal. And this will just run FFI gen. Right? So we can see that it's running. And like I said, this will auto-generate some code that basically just acts as the glue that allows us to call platform code directly from Dart. <laughs> so let's quickly take a peek at the generated code. And this handles things like wrapping around different classes or methods and converting data structures, all the stuff that you don't want to have to worry about. So that was iOS. And on the Android side, things look really similar. We use this tool called JNI Gen. And it similarly has a YAML file that we use to configure it. I'm not going to generate these bindings, because I've already done that. So let's open our Dart file. Like I said, we're trying to build a pedometer app. So I just created bindings for that core motion framework and also for the Health Connect client. So on Android, if I want to make an API request to the Health Connect client, I just want to send a request to aggregate my metric, like my total step count between two timestamps. So this is Dart, and I'm just taking advantage of those bindings that we generated using JNI Gen. But you don't have to take my word for it, because I have my pedometer app already installed on my phone here. So if we could just switch over to this for a second. And here we can see the total number of steps that I've taken today. I had to hand my phone in before, so I don't have that many for the past couple hours. Um, and let me just walk around for a little bit. And it's a little hard because I have like a bajillion wires back here. But I'll just take a couple of steps. And now we'll press refresh and see it update in real time. <laughs> All right. So we just covered how we're trying to make it easier to access platform APIs. Now let's move on to our last theme for mobile, which is graphics performance. So like Tim mentioned before, we recently support started supporting custom fragment shaders with Flutter. And it's been really fun scrolling through Twitter and seeing all the funny things that people are creating. We have glowy text. We're making it snow. We have some waves going on. Really cool stuff. But motion graphics like these only work when you have great app performance to make it a smooth experience. So one feature that we're super proud of is Impeller which, like we mentioned before, is a major rewrite of our graphics engine. For now, you can turn it on for iOS with this flag.
but we're planning to turn it on by default in the next stable release so long as we get good feedback. So please give it a try and let us know what you think. Impeller is a multi-year investment, and our primary goal is to eliminate shader compilation jank and also to match or hopefully beat our current per-frame metrics. And you can see for yourself just how smooth Impeller is by installing Wondrous for iOS. But in some edge cases, like complex SVG clipping, we can see Impeller making a really huge performance difference. So let's see an example. Cool. So I have this fun little kaleidoscope app, and it has some animations that were created by clipping a whole bunch of different SVGs. So on the left-hand side, I have my build that's using Skia, which is our current default renderer. And as we're scrolling down the page, we can see that it struggles a little bit. It's only rendering at about 7 to 10 frames per second. But on the right-hand side is our build using Impeller, which looks really smooth. It's rendering at like 60 frames per second. And Impeller and Skia are both great rendering engines that make different trade-offs. But one advantage that we have because we're building from the ground up is that this new architecture can support brand new use cases. So what if we did want to do something totally new, like maybe 3D? Uh, <laughs> can we get our cool 3D logo? Ah, there we go. <laughs> All right, so who wants to see me make a 3D dash painted entirely in Flutter? All right, let's give it a try. So I'll head back over to my MacBook. And I have to get my devices in order. So if we could just show my MacBook and my iPhone side by side, thanks. So right now I have a pretty simple widget, or a pretty simple app rather. It just has an image widget to display a 2D version of Dash that's created from this PNG file. So nothing fancy. She is looking cute, but I really want to make her 3D. So let me go ahead and switch out this widget over here. And instead, we're going to use a scene. And scene accepts a node, which can take an asset. And in this case, my asset is going to be a model file. It's actually something called a GLB file. So I'll save that. Oops. And reload. And she's 3D. So she's just in this cool little light box. And we can turn her around and see how she's looking. So that looks great, but if you're new to 3D, you're probably wondering, what is this GLB file? <laughs> so this GLB file is just a pretty common way to express 3D data. And you can actually create them or edit them in different tools. This one that I'm using here is called Blender. So I've opened up my dash GLB file in Blender, and here I can make changes. Now, like, let's say I want to change her color. I really wish that she was you know, hot pink. So let's go ahead and select a color down here. And I'm going to set the vertex colors. So you can see she's looking really pink now. I'm going to export this as a GLB file. Actually, let me make sure that I've saved this first. OK, save, export, GLB. We'll save over the previous one we had. So I just made an update to Dash, and I saved it. But wouldn't it be really nice if we could just hot reload and see 3D changes in real time? Do you think we could do it? All right, let's give it a try. Ta-da! She's hot pink. She looks a little sunburned, I think, but she's been in the Nairobi sun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So I think Dash looks pretty nice, but 3D gets really cool when we can add in animations. So I'm going to go ahead and add in an animation. These are just saved 
in my file already. So I just call them by their name, which in this case is walk. I'll save, and again, hot reload. And we can see her walking around. Ooh. Cool. But the thing is that we were just talking about performance, so I think we need to turn it up a notch, right? Instead of just showing a single dash, I think we want to show a whole bunch of dash is. <laughs> so I have my helper function called many nodes, and I'm going to wrap it around my node object. Press save. Again, we'll hot reload. And now we have a whole bunch of dashes. It's actually a cube of dashes, seven by seven cube to be exact. So that's 343 dashes walking around. So that means more than 10,000 individual joints that are being evaluated at every frame with Hot Reload. Thank you, Impeller. <laughs> OK, so I just have one last thing to show you. I'm switching over to my new phone. And this is just an idea of um, the types of experiences that you can build with Flutter. Right, so everything here is painted with Flutter. We have these coins. We have these trees. We have a Flutter logo. It's awesome. But I did want to mention that I switched over to this different phone here. So before, I was on an iPhone 14, but this time, I'm on an iPhone 6, which was announced back in 2014, nearly 10 years ago. <laughs> All right, and that's looking forward on Flutter for mobile. Flutter for 3D, coming soon. I hope you're as excited as we are. Great. Oh my, my heart is full. There is so much amazing things going on here. And I want to pay, pay particular credit to the team who produced so many amazing demos to help us out. Um, so well, let's give them one big round of applause also. As we've said, these are all experimental. This is not intended to represent stuff that you can all play with right now. Some of these demos are, are, are available. Some of them will come soon. But the key point here is that they represent the direction we're going. So as we talk a little bit about the kinds of uh, things that we're working on, uh, I want to just summarize the four themes that we talked about earlier on. We talked about uh, the really high performance graphics. We talked about how we're working on uh, expanding Flutter to different directions. We've talked about new architectures that we're supporting. Uh, we've talked about how we integrate seamlessly between web and mobile. And we've talked about our focus on the developer experience. And so this slide kind of summarizes all of the different things uh, that we've been working on. Every day, we're inspired and honored by your support. We build Flutter with you and for you. I'm from Botswana and Ghana, so being here today is it's special. Now, <laughs> we want to close in recognition that our goal is to help you. And we love seeing the ways that Flutter helps to build a better world. And we want to share a story to close from Africa. <laughs> I was born and raised in the UK, but I grew up with a very strong Nigerian heritage. Nigeria is the fastest growing country in Africa. Africa is the fastest growing continent in the world, and I wanted to be part of that story. I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. When I was 12, I saw my brother building a mobile application, and it felt unreal. Like, how can someone build a mobile app? Our mission at Clasher is to enable African consumers to access global goods and services using African currencies and money methods. When I moved back to Lagos, there was no way for me to access certain stores or marketplaces, especially from branded retailers. And I felt other people could be having this struggle as well. I started Clasher just by myself, ultimately. But eventually, over time, I started meeting people who wanted to make lives better for Africans here on the ground. 
When I was 16, I had learned Android development and I wanted to learn how to build iOS apps. I was watching YouTube. A Flutter video was recommended to me. I watched it. That was why I went for Flutter. We actually started building version one of our app using Flutter because it was flexible and it helped us to deploy the app to both the iOS and Android store just using one code base. When I started working on the app, it was just me. So I built the app the way I wanted and it was sent to Jess and Jess was shocked. Joe Steve had built the app in just three days. After that, he had built version two of the app in two weeks. So this just showed me how easy Flutter was for him to use. I really like Flutter because of the features that it provides, like auto reload, a very good package repository. Communicating with native platforms is also seamless. We have about 300,000 users using Clash today in Nigeria. We're using Flutter and our business is almost two years old and it's going to be able to help us to grow and scale. People are using Clasha to do a multitude of different things. They're shopping from global retailers, using African currencies, and they're getting fast delivery to Africa in seven to 10 days. Seeing the app has now grown, it shows me that I built something that allows people to have a better experience in their day-to-day -day life. We're currently going through digitization here in Africa, and more specifically in Nigeria. And Flutter will help our engineers, leaving us more time for what actually matters building the business logic for Clasher that actually helps solve African consumers' problems.